After the financial scandals of 1721, King George I appointed Robert Walpole to put the country on a more businesslike footing, and he became, in effect, Britain's first Prime Minister. It was during the reign of the second George, however, that a new sort of political manager arose, William Pitt the Elder, an imperialist statesman of genius. At the outset, Pitt was successful in his designs upon the New World. At the Treaty of Paris in 1763, the first British Empire as such was recognised, and among other territories, the British gained all of Canada, and a fair part of Eastern America was controlled by them. But during the long reign of George III, the dream of empire in North America was rudely shattered. Churchill writes, An act was passed through Parliament, authorising the East India Company to ship tea direct to the colonies without paying import duties. The outcry across the Atlantic was instantaneous. In December 1773, the first cargoes arrived in Boston. Rioters disguised as Red Indians boarded the ships and destroyed the cases. You've done four. Have I? Uh, I make it three. Four. Oh. We agreed four. You shouldn't need any more than that. Not just to answer a few questions. Having to think about Boston creates pandemonium in my brain. I, I, I do think it would be wise to make it five. What's the odds of being offered something a trifle more bracing? Ah, nil. They're on their beam ends. Airs and graces, but no gin. Ah, oh, there's a literary gent. Here. Yeah. Can you read? Yeah, bit. My latest novel. For you. Tums. The Brutal Pirate by Samuel <laughs> Ross. <laughs> It's very lively, if you catch my drift. Mm, is that what you write? Phil. Erotic fiction, yes. Mm. Also theatrical criticism. Also political pamphlets. They subsidise my true work, an epic poem about the Holy Grail. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what do you want with him? I shall be wearing my political cap when I speak to Mr Partridge. Are you uh, interested in politics? No. Oh, and it's Judge. Hmm? She's very hot on him being called Judge Partridge. Mm -hmm. I'd have stew the flask if I was you. You'll need all your concentration. He's not always with us. You know what I mean? Mr. Ross. Judge Partridge. May I present my wife? An honour, ma'am. May I say that those of us who know what you've endured admire you deeply. Oh, well, this is pleasant to hear. Most pleasant. <laughs> Tea, ma'am. Shall we breakfast in the garden? The cottage is small, but the view is agreeable. On a clear day, one can see St Paul's. Oh, delightful. Ah, is it always so warm in March? Like an interesting woman, the English climate is completely unpredictable. <laughs> Charming, Mr Ross. Oh, we find the climate most agreeable so far. <laughs> in Boston, one is roasted and frozen in turn. Which is why so many men are mad there. <laughs> Uh, will you make your home here in Hampstead Village? Yes, but uh, not in this cottage. The brewer's fancy isn't really large enough for our needs. I think it's shameful that Parliament has yet to offer you compensation. Mm. After the splendid way in which you behaved. A loyalty you've shown to king and country. Forgive my emotion, but this is something I believe deeply. 
I fear we shall have to wait for an official declaration of war against the colonies before any action is taken on compensation. Uh, you do expect war. Oh, we live in hopes. <laughs> Though there's a fearful stench of conciliation coming from the House of Commons. Billy of Cork. <laughs> no, the stamp tax should never have been repealed. The pressures were tremendous. Oh, damn it, it was a fair tax. <laughs> I mean, every man was required to use a pre stamp paper for his legal documents, which meant that every man would have been doing his best to help the mother country, <laughs> to help England. <laughs> Wasn't that fair? Hey! Wasn't that fair? It was fair. It was fair. But when we read about the riots, Red Boston was in flames. I tell you, sir, had the right heads been blown from the right shoulders in 1765, then the volcano of rebellion would never have erupted. The hydra of revolution would have had its venomous tongue plucked out by the roots. This is England, Thomas. You can speak less colourfully here. It wouldn't surprise me to learn that writing was one of your talents, Judge. Writing? What exactly do you mean? What have you heard about my writing? Nothing. Then how very singular of you to remark upon it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean... Uh, have a dish of tripes. Oh. Eh? Sorry? Thomas. And I... Yes? Go into the cottage. Shall we go into the cottage? It's too dangerous for you, Aunt yeah. The temperature seems to have dropped, and Thomas worries so about my health. If we haven't. Come into the cottage, Mr. Ross. I want you to know I am prepared. Dark thoughts have taken him over. It happens sometimes. Well, they would, wouldn't they? I mean, after all he's been through. Mm. Well, they've gone. They have. Five would have been far more effective. Four seems to have been four too many. Why have you come, Mr. Ross? I mean, what precisely is it that you want? Well, um... First-hand details of your treatment at the hands of the radical mob, and <laughs> that sort of thing. Oh, well, I think I could help you there. <laughs> Do you hear singing? No. What is the point of that ludicrous heathen costume? You fool no one, sir! Sorry. Thomas. Huh? This is not Boston. There are no men in heathen costume on Hampstead Heath. No. No. I thought I heard singing. No. Well, I think we might continue this another time. I don't want to tie you. It's much better for the judge to keep talking. Oh, oh quite, yes. It, it, it is. So, uh, let us talk about um, Monk and... Uh, the boy cider and the and the blood. Oh God! Yes, the blood of it all, and the uh, and the, the massacre oration, and especially the massacre oration. Uh, and we shall, Mister Ross, uh, talk about all of it as soon as I discover who's singing out there. Sorry. Ten years. Fear. Violence. What has occurred, Mr. Ross? We used to be so highly regarded. We gazed down at Boston from our house on Beacon Hill, and our air was rarefied air, fit for those God has chosen to set examples. What has occurred? I'll go, ma'am. Oh, no. Please, stay. There will be lucid moments. Uh, your pamphlet might shame the commons into speeding compensation. And, uh, well, your letter mentioned a fee. And uh, not to put too fine a point on it, Mr. Ross, we could use the five guineas. Ask 
Betty to make you some more tea. Deacon Elliot's corner. You see the mast under their liberty tree? Thomas. Three years on and they're still celebrating the stamp tax rights. <laughs> you know why, don't you? Thomas, because I want Because Samuel to... Adams has declared war on the new import duties. He wants Parliament to grovel again. Mobs in the streets, anarchy, chaos. <laughs> there was a variety of good music and great joy. We shall read that in the Boston Gazette tomorrow. <laughs> That's their euphemism for anarchy and chaos. Thomas, this is 1775. We are in Hampstead, not Boston. That was seven years ago. Anna, there is a wonder I've learned from Lord. The mind can be many places simultaneously. Boston is all round us. The atmosphere is charged with it. Smell the smoke. Muskets. The warehouse fires. Can't you feel the heat? See the steam rising from the streets? Boston. Our inferno. say, Samuel, <laughs> especially considering it was composed by the Antichrist himself. Who? You mean Sam Adams. I mean the Antichrist. You do tend to see life, brother, as a morality play with yourself in the role of good. He is the Antichrist. What other name would you give him? Politicians brings to mind. <laughs> Samuel Adams and his radical crew are not politicians. They are a diabolical cabal. <laughs> Thomas named them that. <laughs> They have created a metropolis of sedition. That's his phrase, too. Anna. Oh, I beg your pardon. I mean, that yowling mob was content only a few years ago. Well, why not? They're the most indulged children on the face of the earth. But when their loving mother asks her pampered offspring to help share the burden of the Seven Years' War, the diabolical cabal poison their minds with talk about liberty endangered and lead them into the most unfilial rebellion against a loving mother. Oh, that diabolical cabal. Oh, very witty. <laughs> Uncle Thomas, hmm? Jonathan says these taxes and duties are passed to give the English merchant an unfair advantage over ours. Jonathan says it's all to do with trade. Jonathan says we must fight these taxes or there'll be more and worse. And that's what Jonathan says. Your brother goes to Harvard College, Peter, where he is taught by degenerate intellectuals. <laughs> But you can't blame Adams for the violence. Well, thousands of men were involved in the riot. Oh, can't we have done with politics? My, My forehead is Dear sister-in-law, Samuel Adams controls the mob. How do you control a mob? Black magic and voodoo. <laughs> Let me demonstrate the pyramid of mobility. Here, Nancy, you have those. There we are. Now, this dish stands for the mob. Right? Your bully boys, your carpenters, your ship's builders, and so forth. They are controlled with near military discipline by one man, Ebenezer McIntosh, who owes his allegiance to the Loyal Nine, who held nocturnal meetings near a distillery. Not surprising, since they depend for their courage upon being near a liquor store. <laughs> the Loyal Nine take orders from John Hancock, 
who is affixed in the manner of the rattles of a rattlesnake to the hindermost parts of Samuel Adams. Who want to bring Adams to trial? Or Hancock or Macintosh? Are you really that naive? Adams is the most powerful man in the assembly. The assembly select the juries, ergo the court... <laughs> Well, come along, children. Off we go. An apt symbol of the times. <laughs> oh. oh, leave that sailor. The maid will tear it up. I do enjoy your conspiracy theories, Thomas. They'll take me right back to the nursery. Yes, well, this is no bedtime story. <laughs> what you can't seem to grasp is that Adams may have organised the resistance, but he didn't manufacture it. The workers, the mob, as you'd call them, fear unemployment. We're still in a recession of commerce. As for the merchants, most of them reject their loving mother at the moment because she kicks her children in the rump at the first sign of competition. You are no Tory, Samuel. <laughs> Next, you'll be refusing English goods. No, Thomas, I'm a Tory. I'm true blue and the company's true blue. I'll toe the line, no fear. I'll never sign the non-importation pledge for the high-minded reason that if I do, my chief backer will pull out of the business. Quite right as hell. I just hope you're aware that by refusing to sign, I place myself in considerable physical danger. Have faith, Samuel. Have faith. <coughs> God walks beside me down the dark alleys, eh? I believe that Parliament in London will send troops to Boston. Troops? The Governor has written to his brother-in-law at the War Office. I myself have written to the Colonial Secretary. Troops would be a disaster. They will restore order. I've written a song in the Handelian mode to celebrate their arrival. Anna shall sing it when they land. The mob will tar and feather her. They shan't hear her. She'll sing it in our private chapel. Dear God, speed the troops to us. Deliver us. Deliver Why didn't he stop taking the stuff? He said he'd been through such terrible agonies. She said so had she. And he said yes, but she didn't suffer from melancholia. Then I guess he drank some because she went all quiet. How the devil I write about him, I do not know. Thomas Partridge, loyalist and opium addict. Oh. I suppose there's a thing. Radical fiends drive famous judge to opium. Mr. Ross? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I've left him in the garden. He's safe enough. He's singing. I heard. It's the song he wrote to welcome the troops. He was sure they'd restore order. He was mistaken. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Mr. Ross. We had 
so much, and what have we left? Some fine china, a few pieces of silver. Where is our house on Beacon Hill? Our estate in Middlesbrough County? Our sons? Your sons? Are they? Only spiritually. They're in Canada. So all the partridges have been driven out of Boston? Uh, not quite all. His brother Samuel remains, still running his importing company. Can't be easy for him. A Tory merchant. Samuel survives. Some men do. Samuel does. Uh, the judge mentioned something about Cider and Monk. Who are they? Or <laughs> what are they? Oh, yes. Cider. He was only 11 years old. Was he on trial? Oh, no. Cider was a victim. He was shot by a man named Richardson. Richardson was on trial. I had... Out there, I had... You'd call it a vision, I think. The, the troops marching under a cold, bright winter sun. Women smiling. Men touching their caps. The king toasted. The mere mention of England bringing a cheer from the crowds on the common. <laughs> Boston shining like paradise regained. But it didn't happen that way, Thomas. Let's think of what might have been. God save our Lord. The king, long live our noble. You uh, <clears throat> were telling me about yes. cider. <laughs> oh, yes. Cider wasn't the important thing. I mean, well, yes, of course, he was important. One man's death diminishes us all, or one boy's death, the fall of a sparrow and so on, but the trial was the important thing. Well, the mobs were, really. The mobs in the courtroom. Mobs actually in the courtroom. Oh, yes. This was 1770. And at that time, the atmosphere was quite frightening. You see, the troops hadn't really made things any better. Oh, if anything, it made things rather worse. God, People would taunt them, throwing stones and bricks at their heads. That's a bit stronger than taunting. Stones and bricks. Fights broke out. The mob simply had no fear of the troops. Politics, and when it came to something like the fight, why they simply stormed the country? The oh, hopes we hang the damn dog. Blood, dog. blood requires blood. Hang the damn dog. Blood requires blood. Hang the damn dog. Blood requires blood. The jury will, of course, not be influenced by our friends in the gallery. They will ask themselves merely... Who was responsible for the death of the boy Cider? Ebenezer Richardson held a gun. But who pulled the trigger? I say that when a man's home is surrounded by a bloodthirsty mob who break his windows and threaten the life of his wife and his children, then I say that man is justified in reaching for his rifle. But a bullet has no mind. It may quite easily strike an innocent bystander, as Cider perhaps was. But do not blame Richardson for his death. Blame, rather, those men who have created a climate of madness here in Boston. Blood, blood requires blood. Hang the damn dog. 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 Blood requires blood! Hang the damn dog! Thomas, you all right? I must have dozed. It's so peaceful in here. Tory asylum in the eye of the storm. Wait up. Wait. <laughs> what happened to you? Set upon by a pack of ferocious eight-year-olds. Wasn't so bad. I prefer blobs of mud to the brick snowballs the twelve-year-olds throw. Do you know what Captain told me the other day? 
that his men are constantly being attacked by children? It's unnatural. They learn to hate the soldiers from their parents. It's logical. It's the devil's logic. Children roaming the streets like packs of wild dogs, attacking soldiers, loyalists, customs officials. They found Richardson guilty then. Not surprising. A mob in the gallery chanting, blood requires blood. I never want to go through another trial like that one. Where's the waiter? Poor Thomas. Your nervous system was made for more orderly times. You'd like life to be organized. Well, like this coffee house. The quiet, reassuring hum of a gentleman's civilized conversation, with only the occasional glimpse of a servant in the background. God <laughs> intended man to live in order, not chaos. Perhaps. But I don't believe God was ever quoted as saying that the 10,000 merchants and landlords of England should also rule two and a half million Americans. And what shame is there in being governed by the greatest nation on the earth? Where the hell is the waiter? Thomas, American merchants want the freedom to develop the vast resources of this continent as they see fit. Then there will be war. I said, where the hell is the waiter? There won't be war, Thomas. The merchants will swear eternal allegiance to Parliament once it acknowledges their right to economic freedom. Oh, there will be war. Samuel Adams will lead the merchants into war. The devil signs no qualified contracts, you know. If he wins, he'll reward them by giving power to the mob, who will scream about democracy while stripping the men of property bare. Where do you keep your ears? In your backside? A wild, garish painting of the future. And only because the thought of even the slightest redistribution of power terrifies you. Answer me, you son of a bitch! Perhaps they don't serve your class of person. You son of a bitch! I'm fed up with you, son of a bitch, you red coats! No sanctuary. The future is blood. War and blood. <laughs> What's that? A mob. <laughs> what else? This is Boston. It's coming from King Street. Celebrating the verdict of the cider trial, I suppose. I, I must find wait, out. You, you wait for me here. Yeah, Thomas, come back. I must find out. It's my duty as a judge. Well, shall I go with you? My duty shall kill me, Samuel. Captain Preston and eight of his soldiers are in jail. There'll be a trial. Because there's no doubt they were provoked. I mean, they faced a mob of 500 men. A mob daring them to fire their muskets. Hardly a physical assault. Well, there are a lot of unanswered questions. I mean, we just have to find out if the soldiers were in any real danger, whether they were actually ordered to fire. Oh, God, I'm so tired. Adams will call it a massacre. My God. The new year, barely three months old. Already he's got six martyrs. You wanted the troops. As much as any man, you're responsible for them being sent. The blood in King Street is on your hands. I must go home. I'll walk with you. No, we'll, we'll talk tonight. I've got thoughts that must be sorted out. Yes. 
<laughs> Here, I, I left my fancy dress costume at home. Partridge, we know you will be one of the judges at the massacre trial. Is it called out already? The Loyal Nine want you to know that if the soldiers are not sentenced to death, you will be. me, Partridge. He says it may take you away from me in mind. I'll have to look after you. I don't want to be strong, Partridge. I don't want to give you this medication. But you must sleep or you'll die. It frightens me to think of you dead. Anna! For God's sake, Anna! <laughs> oh, very witty. <laughs> I say, I never expected him to be so merry. The latest news has been a great relief to him. We're all relieved, Anna, but we're not all merry. The medication has been successful. Uh, clearly. What do we call this medicine? It's a complicated name. It's something beginning with L. <laughs> Laudan? Yes, something like that. Anna, you must wean Thomas off it. It's addictive. <laughs> oh, Sarah, you're so well-versed in so many subjects. But I'll take my advice from Dr. Young. <laughs> Thomas, mm -hmm. you have visitors. Yeah. Hello, Thomas. Oh. <laughs> good to see you looking so well. Oh, I have a good doctor and a strong medication. And Anna says all the good news has cheered you, too. Oh, I thank God that Captain Preston and his soldiers are freed. No, that wasn't God, Thomas. That was a jury of fair-minded men. Oh, no more politics. It gives me such a headache. No, 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 we shan't quarrel. It's Indian summer, and my heart is high. You must be pleased we're importing English goods again. Ah, but think how pleased the American women will be to get good English cloth again after their pathetic attempts to weave their own, eh? <laughs> and to drink decent tea after that wretched stuff that Hancock's been smuggling in from Holland. We shall be like old times again, eh? Oh, it'll be like old times. I do believe you're almost well enough to stop the medication. <laughs> oh... <laughs> No, I, I, I don't think so. Yes, when will you resume your seat in the Supreme Court? Oh, I, 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 I don't think so. I shall retire. <laughs> don't be foolish. What would you do with yourself all day? Do what I do now. Make anagrams of John Hancock and Samuel Adams. <laughs> I doubt that would nourish your mind for very long. Actually, he's writing a book. Mm. Aren't you, my love? Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I am not. No, 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 it's not under the oh, No, yes, no, 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 naughty. <laughs> naughty. <laughs> no. <laughs> You've been taking his medicine, too. <laughs> oh, I love to join in Thomas's fun. He has so much fun these days. What's your book about? Uh, Boston, uh, from the end of the Seven Years' War to the present and beyond. It's <laughs> very witty. I like what you wrote yesterday. Yeah, I, I, I like that. Yeah, there's a very nice bit in there about Samuel Adams. Uh, the bottom of the last page, dear. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes. Here it is. He believed nature intended him for a genius, but seems to have wrested himself from her hands before she had completed her work. <laughs> <laughs> you too, with your English airs and graces. You never think of yourselves as American. And what's so terribly ironic is that to an English gentle person, you'd appear quite degenerate. <laughs> Born as you were amongst the hotchpotch of Scotch, Irish, Germans, convicts, outcasts. Oh, Sarah, you, you really are the most terrible little vixen. My Stop. dear. Stop. This is a day to celebrate, not take up arms. 
Commerce is much improved and the atmosphere in which we live has cooled. And the threat of war has passed. So let us celebrate. <laughs> but Samuel Adams still leaves the Antichrist, walks amongst us yet. <laughs> so there will be. <laughs> There must be war. <laughs> you fainted, my dear, while I was telling Mr. Ross about the attack on you. Thomas, hmm? I want you to talk to Mr. Ross. I want no, you to no, tell no, him no, about no, the massacre. I, I must sleep. No. It's important that he uh, hears it from If you. I think of Boston any no, more Thomas, today, I shall die of pain. Thomas, you shall oh, sleep God, after. No, oh, please, no. I've put the laudanum away. You shan't sleep until you have spoken to Mr. Ross. You've become a very hard woman, Anna. Not yet, but I'm trying. Oh, very well. Let me, let me wash my face first. Naturally, I've told him nothing about Samuel, except to say that you have a brother still in Boston. There's no need for you to mention him. Oh, very well. Do hurry, Thomas. He wants to be returning to London. Thomas? Thomas? What is it? Thomas? Thomas? What is it? This is your doing, isn't it? What is? Partridge and Company have been named tea consignees. Have they indeed? And what, pray, is a tea consignee? Didn't you arrange it? Samuel, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, here I am working quite happily on my book. All right. Parliament, in their infinite stupidity, have decided to bail out the British East India Company. So? They're going to let them sell their tea directly to certain merchants without going through a middleman. In other words, no more tea auctions. I must repeat so. The announcement of who the fortunate merchants are to be was made today. I am one. Oh, congratulations. I have no desire to be associated with this monopoly. East India Company can sell its tea now for far less than anyone else. Well, again, I must say congratulations. I mean, the business should make a very sweet and very well-deserved profit. <laughs> Sam Adams has been waiting two years for an issue like this. Is there no one with a grain of foresight left in England? Can't you see the Gazette? Intolerable interference in our internal affairs. First a tea monopoly, then a cloth monopoly, then a monopoly in agriculture. A disaster. I don't want to be on the wrong side this time. Well, what do you think you'll do? That tea will never be unloaded. Destroyed? English property? Oh, it's going a great deal further than he's ever dared go before. I don't want to be a tea consignee, do you hear me? Samuel, there are these unhappy times when I am forced to remind you that your business depends for its existence upon my money. Damn you, I created the business. There's the effort in supplying the capital. It's only money that came to you simply because you were first born. <laughs> now, don't blame me for primogeniture, Samuel. <laughs> you will graciously accept the company's offer. I will not. In the name of God, I told the colonial secretary... You did arrange this. You unbearable, overbearing, dominating, airs and graces, son of a bitching, drug addict, Anglophile! <laughs> be able to put something together. Mm -hmm. Mobs in the courtroom, physical assaults in the street. Mm -hmm. I'll freeze the blood of any right-thinking Englishman. <laughs> Partridge was wronged. Let loose the dogs of war. Will you let him go unavenged? <laughs> if only I like them. If only I could summon up one drop of sympathy for them. They're third-rate versions of people I hate, even when they're first-rate. You're looking a lot better, John. So, uh, I am to tell you about the massacre oration. If you would, sir. 
do you uh, you know what it is, the massacre oration? Never heard of it. It's a speech made every 5th of March commemorating the Boston Massacre, as he called the soldiers' defense of their lives. He's going through my desk. Stay on the track. Then you'll be able to sleep. He's not going through my desk. He went th through my desk last year. Very good. The massacre oration of 1774 was highly charged, uh, coming as it did only a few months after the uh, <laughs> radicals' jolly little tea party. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God! Monk! Four years have passed since the infamous night of the Boston Massacre. But for Christopher Monk, time stopped that night. His eyes are open, but he sees nothing. If he hears anything, there is no way of saying. He cannot walk, he cannot even sit up. All this the work of one bullet on one night. Yeah. Why have we brought him here today? Why subject him to the ordeal of leaving his bed? To remind you of what the enemy has done to us and will do again. England shall try to make us pay for our tea party, but England is only the enemy without. Even more sinister is the enemy within. Today I will tell you of the perfidy of one man, a respected figure in the community. Here is a work that purports to be a history of Boston. A vile book that vilifies our greatest leaders. And here also are copies of letters that prove that this same respected citizen was in large part responsible for the arrival of troops. Troops that terrorized us, but made Christopher Monk one of the living dead, a man so unrepentant that but a month ago he wrote Lord North calling for the blockade of Boston Harbor in retaliation for the Tea Party. How had they obtained your manuscript and your letters? We'll never know. Samuel. The maid must have let him in. He found them and took them to the Loyal Nine. Why? What is the point of that ludicrous heathen costume? <laughs> you fool, no one, sir. I... I want you to know... I... I am prepared... You are an enemy of Boston, Partridge. This is amusing. It is you, of course, who are the enemy. The enemy of reason. You are responsible for the death of five men. You will not be killed, but you will be punished.
of you to come round. I didn't think. It's a full moon tonight. <laughs> After having been named tea consignee, I had to prove tea, to the radicals where my tea, loyalty lay. Tea, tea consignee. <laughs> Sarah's notion, the manuscript. Oh, smart woman, Sarah. I always said so. <laughs> Never liked her. I had to do it. We must be independent if we're to grow strong, grow rich. England will never leave us our wealth. Old King George, take your hand from our pockets. We'll drop the radicals after We're the war. Born free after the war, the mob will be taught their place, no fear. Now, the classic model will prevail, rulers and ruled. But with a difference, Thomas, the crucial difference, it will be larger than any ruling class in Europe. And it'll be brains, guts, power that can get you into the ruling class, the ruling chamber. Not primogeniture, not what you were born to, not accident, but muscle, sinew, push. And for those who don't make it into the chamber, the compensation of wealth. There'll be more wealth here, Thomas, than history has ever conceived. I'm no European, no Britisher. I'm an American. Any friend of tyranny is an enemy at the liberty tree. <laughs> mm. Will you thank you for me? I'm sorry it was necessary to go through it all the day. Mr. Ross, can you understand them? The Adams lot, I mean, the radicals, the mob. Mad, greedy race of smugglers, etc. Is that what you believe? Well, that's what I write. That's what my paper wants me to write. That's what our readers want to read. But what do you think? Well, I can understand the radicals' point of view. Not wanting 10,000 merchants and landlords of England to rule two and a half million Americans as well. <laughs> yes? Oh, Mr. Touch, it's understood. Why? Why, you all right? Right. What happened? I don't know, do I? <coughs> Call out my name and he went mad. Went? He is mad. Yeah, his brother's <coughs> name Samuel too. Maybe he I don't he... care what he thought. But he's your hero. Oh, yes. You're going to write about him, aren't you? I'll write about him, all right. But not for my editor. For another gentleman of my acquaintance. Well, not a gentleman exactly, but he pays well. And he edits a little radical journal, The Awakener. I can write a piece for him in half an hour. Portrait of a loyalist as madman. Samuel Adams is fled. The Antichrist is defeated. We must never again be torn asunder from our mother England. Our laws are English. Our language is English. Our souls are English. And English we shall ever be. So... Let us cheer for good King George. Him. The Antichrist is defeated. 
We must never again be sundered from our mother England. Our laws are English. Our language is English. Our souls are English. And English we shall ever be. So let us cheer for good King George. Hip, hip! Hooray!